Good morning, church. It's a little empty today, and someone reminded me that it's the marriage retreat. So um, I know there's a lot of people missing and a lot of people sick. Um, so we're going to have to work extra hard to sing, help us out this morning. <clears throat> Can you stand with us? I'm going to begin. <clears throat> uh, we had a prayer time this morning as a worship team, and um, it was really significant on my heart. Um, so I wanted to read these lyrics to you. And when we sing the song next, I want you to um, really proclaim these words out loud. <clears throat> it says, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. You silence all fear. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, your name is a light. This is a good part. That the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever lifted high. Your name cannot be overcome. Breathe. 
to share with you a passage that basically um, speaks of what we just sang about. So let me read that for you. It's the passage that Pastor Chris is going to be teaching from this morning. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, making peace making peace by the blood of his cross 
I hope you're, you're hearing in that passage something very significant. And that is the fact that Jesus is at the top. Jesus is at the top. This morning when I read this passage, there was something in my heart that immediately wanted to bow down to him. Because it is significant to be aware of the presence of God. It is also significant to be aware that Jesus is supreme. That Jesus is at the top of everything. At the top of the living. At the top of the dead. Because he has experienced that too. And so this morning, we want to look to Jesus and consider what it means to bow down our heart, our will, our affections to someone who fills everything in the universe. So what we would like to consider this morning is not, is Jesus at the top? But rather, are we aware that He is supreme? And that we too can bow down our heart, our will, our battles, our affections to someone like Him. So Father, would you please come? Would you please come into this place and surprise us once more with the gift of your revelation and self-disclosure? I ask that you will raise the level of our awareness that not only you are present, but you are supreme. You are, you are worthy of us bowing down everything we've got, everything we are to you. So as the worship team continues leading us, we're going to open this altar prayer, altar place. And if your heart is in that place like mine this morning where I felt like I wanted to bow down to Him, use the altar to do that. Or use it to ask God for mercy. Sometimes I do that. When I can't see what God wants me to see, I say, Jesus, have mercy of me because I'm blind. Have mercy on me. Let's worship together. I just want to remind you that coming to the altar has nothing to do with you being comfortable or feeling like um, this is easy to do. A lot of times it's difficult for us to get out of where we're at and actually come and bow down but it's so right it's so right Fine. 
to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God
joy in our mountaintop experience that there's only one name and there's no one else. We can look for things. We can look for things to to bring that joy, to bring that peace, but man, there's there's none but Jesus. We're going to sing this song. Um, it might be new to you. Um, we're going to sing the verse two and the second chorus in Spanish. So if you don't know Spanish and you don't want to sing it, sing it in English. But there's something special about being here together, singing together, talk, singing Jesus' name. Let's sing this together.
So let's wake up this morning. I want to hear it. There is no one else for me. That's it. That's it. There is no one else for me. Let's sing that again. There is no one else. gift we can offer to you this morning is to give you our yes yes to your influence yes to your influence what's big in our eyes is so small in yours What holds such influence over our lives does not compare to the influence that you have. So on behalf of those who are finding difficult to give a yes to you, in that place, I join them to say yes to you. Yes to you, Jesus. Would you come and speak once more? Yes, I know, Lord, that sometimes we, we have despised your revelation or what you say to us. And so easily we go our own ways and trust in our own devices. Would you be merciful this morning once again and give us the gift of revelation so that we may see you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to ask those who are going to help us uh, worship through our giving and gather the offerings to come forward. And um, as they do, I just want to give you a piece of orientation later on. Uh, the children are going to come back into the service when we are about to do communion. 
So parents, if you haven't prepared your children uh, to participate in communion, uh, make sure you take some time today, maybe at home, after the service, uh, to maybe begin instructing them. We have a resource in the lobby you can always use to walk them through that. And um, so just be mindful of that. You guys can go ahead uh, and gather the offerings. All right. And I would like to uh, dismiss the children, first grade through fifth grade, to just kind of walk quietly. Ms. An Mr. Angelo is meeting you there at the door. He's ready for you. Someone wants to leap. She's excited. All right. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. some powerful words, aren't they? Aren't they? Yes. Take a look at them. These words are worth savoring. They are worth taking them in deep in your soul. They give us such an amazing and beautiful picture of who Jesus is and what he's like. So I would say to you, church, these words are worth your time this morning. Dive into them. They are worth memorizing and exploring. They are worth committing to reading daily, weekly, monthly, yearly if needed. We need to grasp the truth of these words deep in our hearts and our souls and in our minds because these words that we're looking at today have the power to change lives. No matter where you are or what's going on, they have the power, if you will hear them, to reorient your very soul. So we're just going to be able to scratch the surface of these today, and so I would encourage you to dig into these even more. Like these are words that are almost 2,000 years old that we still haven't reached the end of exploring. So get into these, digest them, process them. I encourage you to go deeper. So we have these words that you see here on the screen. They were originally likely written as a poem and we have them because a man named Saul, who was a highly trained individual who was very Old Testament literate, was rabbinically trained, went around killing Christians and was seeking to kill even more of them. And so he has this encounter with Jesus where his whole life is flipped upside down and Jesus changes some things. And so Jesus changes his name to Paul and then tells him, he says, I'm going to send you out to proclaim the gospel, and this is how much you're going to suffer. And so Paul goes about doing that, and then he speaks to a young man named Timothy, and he tells them this phrase. He says, remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. This is the shortest gospel definition we have in Scripture. And Paul says, I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal, for saying these things. So in one such instance where he is chained up like a criminal, he writes this letter to the church of Colossae, and that's why we have these words today. So it's actually Paul and Timothy writing this, and so I want to use this phrase from 2 Timothy as kind of a framework to help us unpack Colossians 1 a little bit. So what was the first one? 
I'm just seeing if you're with me. It's on the screen. Okay, remember Jesus, right? You guys got that one? What's the next one? Okay. Raised from the dead. What's the last one? All right, good. Descended from David. I don't know if I'm spelling it right, but that's all right. Descended from David. This is a little gospel pattern I uncovered a few years ago in the scriptures. It's actually something that Peter and Paul and John use. Every time in the New Testament when they present the gospel, they use this framework. They talk something about Jesus, they talk about him coming back from the dead, and they talk about how he's connected to David or to some other figure in the Old Testament. So this will give us a little framework to unpack what's being said here. So it's actually a man named Epaphras, if you've been tracking with us in Colossians. It's a man named Epaphras that's the one that preaches the gospel, probably out of something like this, to the church of Colossae. And so then they, Paul and Timothy write this letter to them. And so they, they talk to them, they introduce themselves, they pray this amazing prayer that we've been studying throughout January. Uh, and then they go on to start talking about Jesus. It's one of the first things Paul wants to do after he says, I've been praying for you. This is awesome. Look at you guys. You guys are hearing the gospel and doing what it says. So let me just remind you about who Jesus is. So if you put it out in the poem form, this little phrase that we're looking at, it might look something like this if you were to write it out poetically. So we're going to use 2 Timothy 2.8, and we're going to process a little bit of Colossians 1 through that grid. So when we talk about remember Jesus... We're talking about his origin, where he came from, his nature, the history that's behind him, his teaching, his power, his life, his ministry, even his sacrifice. And so I want you to see the first stanza here of our, of our poem. It says, he is the image of the invisible God. So I want to make sure that you guys catch this one. So I'm going to keep these up here um, so that you can keep them in front of you um, as we go along. So image of the invisible God, right? You guys with me? Okay, what does that mean? How can you be the image of something invisible? That's pretty challenging, right? So um, N.T. Wright uses this fantastic analogy to explain this. He says, if you had somebody that was sitting around the corner of a wall and you couldn't see them, one of the ways that you could see them would be to position a mirror so that it would give some kind of reflection and allow you to see what's behind the wall. So I brought a little mirror with me. This is what you guys look like from my viewpoint. How do you look? Yeah. <laughs> Joyce is not shy. No. See, in this, in this mirror, it's not a clip art copy of you. It's not a painting. It's a direct reflection of the reality that's in front of us. So when it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, well, what image would be reflected if we were to put a mirror up to heaven? It would be God himself. That's a stark statement, that Jesus is God. Sometimes that's a hard one for us to grasp. So I wanted you to see that. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God is like, just look at Jesus. He's the exact representation of God. He's also this beautiful picture of what it might look like from a heavenly viewpoint. So I wanted you to see that one. So we're going to go on to the next one, right? The next phrase is, he's the firstborn over all creation. That's a tough one for us, right? Firstborn, how can you be the firstborn over all creation? Now, it's amazing to me, as I read a bunch of commentaries on this, um, how much depth people have gone into trying to explain this one. And it can, you can get into the weeds really, really quick. So I'm gonna break it down really, really simple for you. How is Jesus the firstborn of God? Because he was born of Mary. He's just God's firstborn. It's pretty simple in that regard. But I want you to know something. And we say it that way, and we say, how can Jesus be God and be the firstborn? That gets really complicated for us really, really fast. See, the birth of Jesus is not the first time Jesus shows up. He's not just some creation of God or some afterthought. He wasn't created somewhere out in the cosmos and sent. Jesus was actually there at the beginning. And this gets into some very tough theological understanding for us because this raises the issue of talking about what's called the Trinity. You guys have heard of that? The Trinity. So it can get very complicated, and I've actually heard it put this way, that trying to understand the Trinity is like trying to take a bowling ball and fit it into a tiny little brown paper sack. It just won't fit. Like, our brains won't totally get the Trinity. We can sort of understand some of it, but not all of it. 
So I thought, what better way to help unpack the Trinity than to bring a satire-laden, sarcastic cartoon? All right, so I'm going to show you one. Uh, I don't mean this to be offensive to anybody, so if it offends you, I apologize up front. Uh, I hope you laugh. I hope you find it funny, but also uh, very uh, engaging and full of good content. So take a look. Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms, liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick. What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! <laughs> uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. <laughs> That's Arianism, Patrick. Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. <laughs> You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism, a heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five <laughs> robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously. I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Modalism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an animal. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, I quit beating around the bush, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> so in case you didn't catch it, this is what he said at the end. So there's this beautiful creed called the Athanasian Creed that espouses the good doctrine of the Trinity, that we worship one God in Trinity, Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess, that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. So the Trinity is something that's best comprehended by faith. It's not something that the best human reasoning will ever be able to give us a 100% grasp on. And I would say to us, that's a good thing. If God were totally containable to our understanding, God would not be beyond us. It's a significant truth for us. So we can know in part some of the mystery of the Trinity and of the Incarnation, but we can't know the whole of it. So this is a call for faith in regards to that. So that's the first two that we've looked at. And this poem continues here in the beginning. It says, he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And look at the next part. For by him all things were created, right? That means that Jesus is the creator of all things. That's a distinct one, because if he was some creation or an afterthought of God and came later, he couldn't have been there in the beginning. But he is there in the beginning, and he's the one that creates the physical and the natural, the spiritual and the invisible. He creates the nations and the rulers and the authorities. So all of creation is created by Jesus for Jesus. 
That's a big thing. So I want to show you something. That's sometimes hard for us to grasp. So I want you to see this from Genesis. If you go all the way back into Genesis, it says, God said, let there be light. Who said it? God. God said, let the expanse in the water be in the midst of the waters, right? Verse 9, let the waters under heavens be gathered. God said these things. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. God said, let the lights be in the expanse. God said, let the waters swarm and let the birds fly. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. And then he said, this thing right here, and I want you to see this. God said all those things, and then it changes in verse 26. Let us make man in our image. It goes from singular to plural when it comes to human beings. Have you ever wondered why you're so weird? <laughs> ever wondered why you're such a complex person? See, everyone has a father, but everyone's a child of someone. There's this spiritual side of you where you can talk to yourself on the inside and nobody else hears you. There's something about you, yes. <laughs> There's something about you that's visible and invisible, physical yet spiritual. There's something about you that wants to rule yet be under good authority. So you have the function of being able to create life, and you're a creation yourself. The reason for that is you were made in a Trinitarian image. See, all that Jesus has made, he gives an example of it in you. The way that God and the Spirit and the Son work together is an example of you. So he created you for himself. And that's the way it was supposed to be, right? God created you for him. But let's be honest, has it worked out that way? If I had to ask you to give a percentage of your life that was lived according to Jesus' way, what percentage would you give yourself? 10%? 50%? Nobody's 100. I can prove it to you in one question. Have you ever told a lie? 99%. <laughs> it happens. So you were created by God, for God, by Jesus, for Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit. But sin has ruined that. It's tainted you. It's left you stained. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go along. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. He's the creator of all things. That's a mouthful right there, isn't it? But Paul didn't stop there. He didn't say, that's all you need to know. He went on and said, let's remember that Jesus was also raised from the dead. So these are things that talk about Jesus fulfilling the law, the sacrifice in which he gave himself up, grace, mercy, redemption, the victory that he won, the future and a new creation. So if you were to take our Colossians 1 poem and you were to put some verses side by side, uh, you would see an example like this. So you see this first verse and then the last verse here, but he's the image of the invisible God, and that's paralleled with he's beginning the firstborn from the dead. That's a significant phrase for us because I want you to see that. We're not just going back here in this verse and talking about how Jesus got there in the first place. We're talking about Jesus being the beginning of something new. So Jesus is, I lost, there's my marker, all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, he's the beginning of a new creation. Until Jesus comes along, the world had never seen what it looks like when somebody goes through death and then comes back. When Jesus goes into death and then comes back, it is something very significant because he's beginning the commencement of a new creation where death is done away with. So when you start to look at that a little bit more, it says he's the beginning of something new. He's the beginning of that something new because he's the firstborn from the dead. That's interesting to me that the Bible paints Jesus as having two births. Do you know what they are? Remember, he was born from Mary, was born of water, and then he was born from the grave, first born from among the dead. That's his second birth. And I find that very interesting because when Jesus says to Nicodemus, if anyone would see or enter the kingdom of God, they must be born again. I think in part Jesus is talking to him about the resurrection. See, Jesus goes and he conquers death by going through death. And I would say to you, if you're a Christian, the resurrection is everything to your faith. 
If you take away the the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if it were never to have happened and it would not have happened and could not have happened and whatever the people would say about it, and you take it away, you disembowel Christianity. It has nothing to stand on because all we would have if there was no resurrection is a dead leader from the first century. It's a significant thing for us. And when you start to look at the resurrection and the reality of it, it frames for us a new way of doing life because the resurrection establishes an eternal accountability. That's a big phrase. See, if this is all we have and your life ends when you die and there's nothing else, Scripture would tell you, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die and nothing matters after you're gone. But in the resurrection, it says everything matters. Listen to these words from the book of Revelation. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. How did the dead stand up before the throne of God? We're not talking about zombies here. We're talking about raised to life people. And it says books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had been done as recorded in the books. Can you imagine that picture? Everything you've ever done being read out loud in front of all of creation. Everybody coming back to life. This is where you'll be face-to-face with Moses, Elijah. You'll see the apostles. You'll have Adam and Eve standing there, and you can all go to Adam and be like, dude, why? (laughs) We're going to have that moment. But let's be honest. If that book got read out loud, would you be ready for it? Would you want people to hear what's in it? I certainly don't. See, when we have a promise of a new creation... There's an eternal accountability where we have to face the music. And we understand, like, Jesus came back from the dead. I think we're pretty good with that one. But I don't think we're very good at it for ourselves. These are a couple of verses that I love out of Scripture. They're some of my favorite ones. But by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. This might be a little scary to us. Like, Jesus is going to scoop the dirt off your coffin and rip the lid off and lift you out of it alive. And then these books are going to be read. Well, darn it. (laughs) Brought me back to life to read all the stuff I did. But let's look at why Jesus died. Let's look at the rest of our verse here. Through him to reconcile to himself all things. That he would make peace by the shedding of his blood on the cross. So the resurrection teaches us that Jesus is a reconciler and a peacemaker. The word reconcile means to restore friendly relations. The word peace means that he would give you wholeness. So if that sacrifice is applied to your life, that's an amazing new reality. Those things that are in that book would then be dealt with. So if you were here uh, for Christmas Eve service, uh, Pastor Isai said something that just struck me as very, very profound. And so I want to unpack just my thought on that for a second. But he talked about this tribe, these two tribes that were were warring, and they were cannibal tribes. And you guys know what cannibals do, right? They eat each other. It's disgusting. So they would go to war, they would kill each other, eat each other. So a missionary went there and started studying their culture. And what they found out is that when these two tribes wanted to stop being at war, what they would do is they would give a child to the other tribe. And as long as that child was alive, there would be peace between the two tribes. It was called child peace. And it makes sense, right? If the other tribe has one of your children, you don't want to kill them because you don't want to take out your own. And when he said that, this light bulb went off in my head, and I I said to myself, I said, Isai just explained everything that's wrong with American Christianity. And I'll tell you why I had that thought. Because I tried to flip the story in my mind, and I thought, if I was a missionary from another country, and I came here to America, and I was looking for a cultural parallel like this missionary did to preach the gospel... What, what metaphor would I use? Well, the easiest one to pop up is debt. So unless you've gone through Financial Peace University, shameless plug for that course, and you follow the steps, most people in America have significant debt. And so I remember back in the day when I became a new Christian, that was the metaphor. I remember people talking about, imagine you have this credit card and you've run it up full of sin, and then you realize that you have this balance that you can't pay, So you go to Jesus, and he pays off your debt. Woo, right? There was even a youth group back in the day that was giving out credit cards with Jesus' name on them. It's a true story. Do you see where this breaks down, though, right? 
Because what do you do when you end up with a zero balance on your credit card? Let's go spend up. Let's go run this thing up. And when it gets too big, then we'll come to Jesus again and he'll pay it off again. Do you see the cycle? Does Jesus forgive you? Absolutely. But I would say Jesus being your credit card for sin is not the gospel. Jesus did not come to bankroll your sin. He did not come to reconcile you to having friendly relationships with sin. He came to reconcile you to having friendly relationship with him. So he paid for that by his own blood. We should not take that for granted. We should not use it as an excuse. Does Jesus forgive? Absolutely. Absolutely he forgives, but forgiveness is not the end game for God. Love is. The loving relationship where you hear his voice and you obey it just because it's God. So you see where we've gone so far. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He's the creator of all things. He's the beginning of a new creation, the firstborn of the dead, a reconciler and a peacemaker. Like, we could stop right there, right? But let me say something. There's more. Are you excited about that? Is this raising anything for you? This should. This is amazing stuff. So Paul goes on, he says, he's descended from David. This has everything to do with his lordship and his authority, his rule and reign, his position, his place above everything, and his eternal nature. See, God promised David, King David, way back in history, he promised that one day one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever and rule the people. Well, the only way you can sit on the throne forever is if you've been raised from the dead. That's a pretty significant thing because otherwise any ruler that would sit on the throne would die. So in Jesus, you have this creator, this firstborn from among the dead who created all the rulers and the thrones and the powers and the authorities, and this says he is over all of them. I know that's a hard one for us to grasp, but do you know why things are so broken in the world? Because there are people that have been put in authority that no longer recognize Jesus as the ultimate authority. So they lead out of their flesh and they break things. So Jesus is the one ruler over all of these things. And so our poem here in Colossians chapter one talks about the kind of ruler that Jesus is. So I want you to see this one. He is the head of the body, which is the church. So he's the head of the church. I want you to see that one. So how do we talk about this? What does it mean that Jesus is the head of the church? So you guys have probably seen this verse before, right? Uh, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Who's heard it before? Okay, good. This is usually where people stop. And I'll be quite candid with you. I've heard this preached in a way that basically says the husband has to die in order to keep the wife happy. So most husbands are like, oh, man. It just guns them down. So then they start feeling like they never have an original thought. They never get to have any hobbies. They have no hopes or dreams because they just have to die. But let's do something for a minute. Let's take the husbands out and let's go on past the comma and let's, let's look at Jesus for a minute. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. That's a different picture, isn't it? Do we want that kind of leadership? Do we want leadership where Jesus makes sacrifice for reconciliation and peace? Where Jesus sanctifies you? So I'm just gonna talk to the men for a second. You will never be able to lead unless you let Jesus do this in you. Women, don't you want men to lead like that? Yes. Then I'll give you just one hint. Encourage their relationship with Jesus. It's a big thing because you will never be able to help sanctify anything or wash anything or present anything if you don't let Jesus do it for you. So men, run to Jesus. He is your head, he is your leader. Press into him on these things. That gives us a fuller picture. But it doesn't just stop there. It says Jesus is also the one that holds all things together. This is a pretty significant one. He holds it all together. That's a big truth for us, right? So I want to talk to you about something. Um, the scientific people are up in arms that I'm going to use this as an analogy. 
But I got this from a guy named Lou Giglio. Um, if any of you know Steve Van Zura, he looks a lot like Lou. Um, just saying. Um, he talks about this story where he encountered a molecular biologist, and he told him about this protein in your body called laminin. Anybody ever heard of it? Okay, a couple of you. We're not talking about laminate flooring or anything like that. We're talking about a protein in your body. And this is what the protein does. Laminins critically contribute to cell attachment and differentiation, cell shape and movement, maintenance of tissue, and promotion of tissue survival. That's a pretty cool definition, right? There's a little protein in your body that tells your cells what to attach to. Without it, your skin cells don't know to go attach to each other. Without it, your liver cells can't tell the difference if they're a liver cell or a lung cell, right? It determines the shape and the movement, the way that your tissue maintains itself and the way that your body survives. That all happens, happens because of a little thing called laminin in your body. Anybody ever seen one? I'm not sure you're getting it yet. Here's what they look like. Do you get it? If you get a little closer, they look like this. The very thing that helps your cells know where to go and what to do is in the shape of what they crucified Jesus on. So when it says he holds all things together, I find this to be a very fitting metaphor that what contributes to the way that your body stays together, without it, your body would turn into a pile of mush. It says Jesus is the one who holds all things together. It's an example for you of what that might look like. So we've looked at a lot, right? It's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the creator of all things, the beginning of a new creation, the firstborn from the dead, the reconciler and peacemaker. He's the head of the church, and he holds it all together. But we're not done. There's one more thing. So I'm gonna change the translation on you. You don't use the word preeminent very often, so I like the version that says he's done all of this so that in everything he might have the supremacy. If I could put it in another visual for you. Jesus is supreme in all of those things. From the beginning to the end of what he's establishing, he will reign supreme. He is above all things but he is in all things. So I want you to look at this. This is our passage. I've been putting this passage in front of people over the last week or so. And we read it out loud together. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent or have supremacy. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So I've been reading that with people, and then I dropped this question on them. How does this help you in what you're going through right now? How does this help you in what you're going through right now? I'll be very, very candid with you. A few people ventured kind of a typical Christian answer, like I know there's gotta be one here, so I'll kind of fish for it. But one person got very honest, another got even more honest. One of them said, said, I know this is true. It's like up here, but I don't feel it here. When I'm going through stuff, I really don't feel like he's holding it all together. And another person looked straight at this passage and just said, I got nothing. Is it possible that we've lost the image of Christ in the church? Is it possible that we've gone chasing other things and have not given enough attention to the majesty and grandeur of Jesus? 
Because we'll be honest, I mean, as a church, we talk so much about the process that we're in and becoming like Christ, and we talk about that being a sanctifying process, and we tell you, especially from this stage, that it's necessary and loving for you to talk about the stuff going on in your life. That it's actually a qualifying thing for us if you would be honest about the mess that you have. You have to deal with what's going on in your heart to get healthy. But I'll be honest with you, the world tells you there's ways to deal with the stuff in your heart. Listen to what the world would tell you. Don't like your looks? Get surgery. Don't like your weight? Go on an extreme diet. Don't like your spouse? You can get divorced for 80 bucks and get a new one. Don't like your kids? Just ignore them because eventually they'll leave the home. And if you can't stand them, just stick a screen in their face. If you don't like your emotions, you can drink, smoke, take drugs, overeat, or even cut yourself to get rid of them. You don't like your pain, we'll run or move as far away as fast as you can. If you don't want to be honest, just lie or pretend or just fake that somebody just called you. You don't like feeling guilty, we'll blame somebody else for it. You don't like how people think of you, then just rebrand yourself or indulge in more experiences. If you don't feel happy, we'll just do whatever your heart tells you to do. So the world offers you all kinds of ways to deal with your mess. But when it comes to the church, compared to every other institution, organization, philosophy, or mode of thinking, the church should have the one thing the world cannot offer you. And that's a picture of this Jesus. That he would be supreme in all things, supreme in every area of your life. I gotta be honest, I am stunned over and over again at how little I find that Christians want to talk about him. I'm not saying that to put anybody down, but I know a lot of Christians who are more focused on their conversation about demons and the end times than they are about the grandeur and greatness of Christ. I've heard more comments about preaching and music than I've ever heard about the greatness of Jesus. I think we've missed it. I long for this kind of conversation where we can press in to who he is. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about those other things. There's nothing wrong with talking about those things. But we should talk about them as they pertain to Christ. Sometimes we miss it. So I want to talk about um, what I want you to do with this. So we've got this amazing Jesus that we're talking about, who is all these things that we wrote up here, wants to be supreme in all things. So how does that matter to you right now? Well, there's these things called gospel battlefields. It's really your heart. So will blank be supreme or will Christ be supreme? So I'll share one of mine with you. Um, and please know, I'm not, I'm not saying this to fish for any compliments afterwards. I'm just being honest with you. Every time I speak or counsel, I do some kind of training, I do a teaching, I hear this accusation come at me that says, every time you speak, Chris, somebody gets mad. You don't really have anything to say they're not going to like you, so just shut up, stupid. You don't know enough to really teach anybody anything. I hear that inside. That's that weird, complex part. That's a gospel battlefield for me. Because am I going to let fear of man and accusation be supreme? Or am I going to let Christ be supreme? We can take this into hundreds of areas. Will your selfishness be supreme? Or will Christ be supreme? Will materialism be supreme or Christ supreme? Will being intellectually superior be supreme or Christ supreme? Will your way be supreme or his way be supreme? Will bitterness and revenge and vengeance be supreme or will Christ be supreme? Will overindulgence be supreme or Christ? Will your broken heart and your circumstances be supreme or will Christ be supreme? Will your conflict be supreme or will Christ be supreme? We can go into career, we can go into money, we can go into parenting. Will any of those things be supreme or will Christ be supreme? So what I want to extend to you today, church, is a new invitation to seek Jesus. Seek him with your whole heart because if, there's, if you're not finding him, like the promise of Jeremiah says, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you're not finding God, you're probably holding something back. Give him the whole thing. Give him the whole mess because he's already got it recorded. 
It's already going to be read out loud. So do yourself a favor and be honest with him. Because I once heard it said, I once heard it said that if you got a glimpse of Jesus, like if he pulled back the curtain of heaven for just one second and you saw him, you would crawl across the burning desert full of razor blades just to get to him. We need a bigger picture of Jesus. We need one that will overwhelm the circumstances and the stuff that we keep back because there's freedom on the other side. There's a restored and renewed relationship with him that happens when you come to the other side of these things. So we have a Jesus who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the one who created you. He's beginning a new creation by coming back from the dead. He's reconciling and bringing peace. He's the head of the church, the one that holds it all together, and he is supreme in all things. Do you know him? Do you hear his voice? That's the invitation today. So we're gonna take a time of communion together. So if your honest desire in your heart is that you want to know Jesus, you want to be reconciled to friendly relationship with him, then communion is for you. We're proclaiming his death when we take communion that the bread represents his body, which was broken. The cup represents his blood, which was poured out for you so that you could have peace. So if you're willing to trust him to do that, that's called faith. I would encourage you to fight that fight. So I'm gonna put these words up for you again. As you take communion, which part of this description of Jesus creates the most wow in your heart? That's what you're gonna to celebrate today when you take communion. Like Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Wow! That's why you're taking communion. Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. Wow! How is that even possible? That's why you take communion. That he would be supreme in all of the things that you face. Sometimes that's enough of a wow. But that's why you take communion. So let me pray for you. And then when you're ready, you can come respond by taking communion together. Jesus, this is an amazing picture of who you are. Sometimes it's so amazing, it feels impossible for us to totally get it. So would you increase here at Living Faith Alliance Church, would you increase our view of Jesus? Would you help us to see him as the creator of all things? Help us to see him as the head of the church. Give us the courage to let him wash away our mess so that we would be presentable to him. So Jesus, we want you to be supreme in all things. So would you draw near to our broken, frail, and messed up hearts that we would know you today as our reconciler and peacemaker and so much more.
I know I needed a reminder this week of um, how powerful my God is and that he's able to break all those chains at the parent summit um, we had a speaker come down from Nyack and he, he put his hands up like this and he said I'm encouraging you just a picture like Jesus breaking our chains and there's so much power in his name. And when we say it out loud, it's, oh, man. There's one part in this song. It talks about there's an army rising up. Man, I just, I picture, like, living faith alliance. Like, sing this out. There is power in the name. Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every. Let's stay there for a second. There is power. There is power. Jesus, lift our voices this morning. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. 
break every chain, break every, sing that again, do we believe it? To break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain.
together. I think that song is for us. I believe that this morning, as we were singing that song, the picture I got was that this Jesus, who is supreme, was wounded but victorious. Our Savior is a wounded, victorious King. And the army that He's rising up in this church, in this community, in this corner of South Jersey, is to be a wounded, victorious army. Because we are wounded. You have been wounded. But that is not the end of the story. In fact, you will be wounded. This is the world we live in. A world that is broken with people that's broken. And so this Jesus knows how to deal beautifully with the wounded. This Jesus knows how to lead the wounded to victory and victory and victory and victory. He knows how to do it. And so allow your heart to gain hope. Allow hope to rise up in you. Jesus is not done writing your story. And the story he promises will end very well. It will. So friend, invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Just tell him in your heart, Holy Spirit, speak to me. You have words of life. might be telling some of you come and receive prayer for that gospel battle in your heart he might be saying to some of you how about you move towards that person and encourage them with your story today he might be saying to some of you it's time to get in the battlefield it's time to fight in faith, trusting that King Jesus will lead you well. To others, he may be saying, it's time to hope in him. It's time to stop hoping in the things that fade away. It's time. So wherever you're at, I'm going to ask people willing to pray for others to come forward, fill this altar, and we'll be here available to pray for you. We're not done. We have a few, um, a moment, short moment. So if you need to get your kids, you can do that. Um, I'll ask the worship team to lead us again in that Breaking Chains song. That may be the song that you need to...